The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the show. We are at the interview part. And uh, today, uh, joining us all the way from the UK, um, we're going to be talking about uh, Jack the Ripper and actually uh, talk about her book called Jacob the Ripper. So uh, joining us today is Tracy Ianson. Ianson. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Tracy. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, sitting co-host, of course, is uh, Michael Hawley. He's our Jack the Ripper man, and, and he just fell down, so don't worry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Hello. <laughs> you know, he's fallen. He, he can never get up. That's terrible. Uh, it's, gonna, a, it's an age thing. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to get him one of those, like, buzzer things so that they can come, come rescue him, right, you know? Uh, he's wearing diapers now. I don't know if you knew that. That's an image that I really <laughs> could have done without, but thanks for that. <laughs> well, just, you know, just so you know, uh, you know, so, so don't scream at him too loud because it could get pretty messy, right? You know, mess the chair up. Yeah, Al's just my age, so we are, I'm actually Al's elder, right, Al? Yeah, you're, yeah, like, okay. you're like a month older or something. Month older. <laughs> but you certainly looked at least 10 years, but that's... You know. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so now Tracy, uh, Jacob the Ripper. So first of all, how did how did you get interested enough to get into a book? You know, and actually spending the time and effort to to research and write about uh, you know Jack the Ripper case and do Jacob the Ripper. Yeah, um, I mean, Jacob was initially my father, Niels. Um, first suspect, I was interested more in high and piums. Um, so we just got like together as a friendly competition, you know, pit one suspect against another. Right. Um, it ended up found out the high and piums was actually mistaken identity with another high and piums. So as a suspect, he became kind of defunct. So I kind of just jumped onto my dad's hmm. bandwagon, really. Um, and we just kept sitting down, talking, what ifs, what if this, and then we'd go away separately and we'd find that this what if had happened. You know, um, it was posited what if they were cousins, so went away. It took a couple of months, it wasn't overnight, but finally found that they were cousins and it was just like a little tick box you know what if this what if this what if this and we just kept finding these things that could link him to all aspects of the crime and um, so it just became one of those fact-finding mission type things that we just both right. really enjoyed doing what did, did, did you have like a, a natural interest in in historical crimes or are you into true crime like what What's kind um, of, yeah. I think we probably wouldn't be allowed nowadays, but my dad used to have like a monthly, I believe off the top of my head, it was called True Crime magazines. Um, so each month you would be issued and delivered a True Crime magazine. And about the age of eight, nine, I started reading the less um, creepy ones. <laughs> and again, me and me dad would just discuss them, other possibilities, and... Uh, so there's always been that kind of puzzlement, fascination with how things could have been, how they did happen and things like this, why they happened. Uh, and we've just both sort of really kept that, um, that going, really. So we can sit for hours just discussing crimes, how they may have committed, why they were committed, who did it. Hmm. Waft for it's just like a little hobby, I suppose you could say. Was that those, um, mag was that those magazines that ha always had a woman tied up in in a trunk or something? No, not them ones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm saying, I, I don't know what other magazines he had, but these ones were just a plain black cover um, with red writing. Okay. So I wasn't too traumatized too young. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I just I used to I used to look at them when I was a kid. Like, but that uh, yeah, I'm I, that was back in the '60s, '70s. It would have been in the, those true right. true crime, two murder and stuff like that. And they always had some. Yeah. Sort of, it, it always looked kind of that way. So just curious. Mm. <laughs> so so how how has the Ripper community been for you, uh, jumping in and putting this book out? How how have they received you? Um, I mean, I think it's like with every community, you always get a few of the naysayers and the people who know better. But I will say for the most part, people have been absolutely fantastic. Um, we've had a few researchers who've actually given us information that they could have posted and took credit for. They've kept back for quite a while um, before the book finally got published. Uh, they gifted us really this information. Uh, just so we could use it in the book. Uh, we had one gentleman, Chris, who went to the Stone Asylum Cemetery to take the photos for us uh, because of it. we live quite a couple of hundred miles away. Um, so people have just been absolutely brilliant for the most part. I think there's an interest there. People are just curious, curiosities piqued and they want to know how far this is going to go. Uh, so we're still waiting on some kind of feedback. Obviously, we've had positive feedback, but not many questions on the book yet. Hmm. Oh, so, it won't be long. They're, they're a nasty group. <laughs> they're, they're just a, yes. I'm just saying, I'm just warning you now. It's not going to be long. Well, well this is what <laughs> I expected from the outset. Um, them few naysayers can make up for all the good people out there but yeah. as yet it hasn't been you know it's kind of like waiting on the knife's edge waiting <laughs> for it kind of so yeah i mean being a female when i first started ripperology it it kind of I, I had to fight to get the respect just for the simple fact i was female and younger um, but also tracy I just want to add that one of the things that uh, I love about your research is similar to what I do is we are kind of considered uh, suspect ripperologists, so we're not yes. generalists. Yes. And uh, automatically, some of those, some of them think we are automatically biased. Therefore, we should, uh, you, you know, our books are suspect. And so, yes. but what I, that's why I love about your book is that of the tremendous amount of research you did and uh and that's what's getting uh i think so far some uh excellent reviews even from you know listening to some of the top reviewers uh we uh like paul Begg and stuff that they really enjoy the depth of research that you did when you got into the family of the levies oh, is uh, to me it's just exciting that's i'm really pleased to hear that uh, i mean i did the i'd say about 60 percent in lockdown last and uh, the month that we were off just uh, just something to do. I write in a book, maybe not so much. The research I just loved. Uh, maybe it's yes. the female curiosity in me, I don't know. I just love the nosiness of it all, finding out who's who, what's what. Um, right, right. So, yeah, I think that is what I enjoyed doing most. But uh, going back to that, yes, uh, we have been basically called the gutter tripe of ripperology, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> suspect is therefore you're the lowest of the law. Uh, people, <laughs> some people tend to think that you can't be more than one category, mm. uh, right. which is actually rubbish. But yeah, well, and, and you so, think they treat Michael yeah. better because he's an older woman, you know. Not <laughs> Well, I've got that woman's kind of sense too that I love my my research. But that's uh, but that's but I think what uh, we needed, uh, what we are, is we're thicker skinned in a lot of ways because you're going to get it from all sorts. But in a way, that's kind of the way how we in the ripperology world get our peer review. When it's quality skepticism and they go for it, by all means, that should be welcomed. And then uh, so you're definitely going to you know, have the critics and or just per certain aspects of some kind of theory. But uh, so I, I see everything as, as good about that. So that's great, Tracy. Oh, thank you. It, it is. It's quite exciting. Um, like I say, hopefully 
we start getting some feedback. As you say, negative as well as positive. You need the negative feedback to double check your own facts, your own sources. Uh, sometimes that negative feedback can pick up something that you've missed. So right. you, you never want it, but at the same time, it can be helpful. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So, so the Levy family, it sounds like you've done a lot of research on them. Uh, how is that to do research on a family when you're kind of accusing a relative of theirs, uh, maybe distant, of being maybe the the, the killer, you know, of, of a yeah. case? Yeah. Me personally, uh, and I'm not by any means saying I'm, I'm normal, but I would find it exciting. Um, because it's so far away from who you are and what you are nowadays. I do get that it could be a distant relative, but I would be fascinated with that. For, like you say, the Levy family, I, I would hope that they just take what we say and realise that this is never anything on them. Um, we put in the book that we can't prove it was him. It is literally just everything adds up to him. Um, so until we actually do get some feedback, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure how I would react. Um, it would depend on how they would react, I would imagine. So hmm. um, it, it is a, a valid question, but I'm just not sure, to be honest. Yeah. Um, well, you just don't know. I mean, I'm just finishing a book now, and it's an edit. And a lot of the families, so some of them, they've got a copy of it before publication, and then they give me their feedback. So uh, that's kind of how I do it now. But uh, but I'm not, right. you know, I, Jake, Jack the Ripper is a huge case. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's going to have, I think you'll have both effects. You'll have some people that think it's fantastic if they're relative, and some people that will be devastated. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, we try to be as respectful as possible. We did have a photograph um, of Isaac, one of his elder sons, that we decided not to put in the book, just as a show of respect, um, because it didn't really give anything to the book. Uh, so, yes, it's out there, um, but we just felt that people didn't need to see that. Um, it was just a picture of him in elder life. You know, there was nothing wrong with the picture. But like you say, we try not to cross too many boundaries uh, because he is so much of the genealogy there uh, for the generations. We try to keep it as basic as possible. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll see how they react. Like you say, it could go either way. So Tracy, um, Jacob Levy as a suspect, how does that relate to a, uh, a, a Joseph Levy? Yes, uh, Joseph Levy, Joseph Hyam Levy was one of three witnesses to see Catherine Eddowes with a gentleman just before her murder. Uh, that was Harry Harris and Joseph Lawand as well that just left the International Men's Club uh, it was said at the time in local newspaper that Joseph Haim Levy had an air of knowing about him and was reluctant to talk so this got us curious obviously with the last name Levy whether they would be related um, it would explain why he would be so reluctant to talk. Um, and like we say, it took quite a while, but we finally found that they were, in fact, first cousins. Their fathers, Joseph Levy and Hyam Levy, were brothers. So they actually lived quite close. They were both butchers. Um, and Jacob Levy actually moved into Joseph Hyam Levy's childhood home. Um, he bought it from his aunt Frances, just Pine Levy's mother. So there were interconnections. We we don't know if they were close. We don't have that information, but they obviously knew each other. So the possible uh, possibility is that when Joseph identified that person that was with likely Catherine Eddowes and mm -hmm. noticed that it was his first cousin, that's mm -hmm. when he uh, kept his, kept quiet. 
We think that's highly likely. Um, one, the only thing that he really gave in any of the interviews was the suspect was two to three inches taller than the victim. Um, Catherine Edgar has been five foot. So Jacob Levy was five foot three. Now, it seems a little odd that that's all he noticed, but that's all the information he would give. Uh, so there was also Harry Harris and Joseph Lawan there as well. Harry Harris stated he didn't know anything, he didn't see anything at all. Um, Joseph Lawan did give quite a different description, so there's some discrepancies, admittedly. We tend to think it's likely that if Joseph Hyam Levy did recognise Jacob, then he probably could have convinced himself at first that he only seen him with the victim. He didn't actually see that there was any murder right there and then. And obviously, people are familiar with Israel Lipsky case the year before, where a Jewish man was hanged and it is likely that he was innocent. But the case brought such a fury and hatred towards Jewish people and the Jewish population. Because of it, did Joseph Hyam Levy want a chance bringing that on to his family right at this moment in time when it was all still fresh in people's minds? And as you say, Jack the Ripper was, it was just all over the place at that time. So he had to tread carefully, I think, to make sure that he saw what he saw and not just go straight away um, shouting that his cousin was guilty. So speaking of well, how about Jacob Levy, uh, he was a butcher and that he is a suspect. How did he become a suspect? We don't know that he was a suspect at the time, although he definitely would have been investigated just simply because where he lived was the epicentre of the killings um, in 36 Middlesex Street or Petticoat Lane. Um, it was known by both names. All butchers within the radius of the crimes were at least interviewed by the police. Also, given his history with mental illness um, in 1886, his butchery skills, it's highly likely that he would have been at the very least interviewed at the time. We know that Mark King put him forward about 20 years ago as a suspect. Um, but he couldn't... Obviously, information back then wasn't as readily available. He just couldn't find the information to hand to prove that there were cousins. And your father uh, knew of this, and that convinced your father quite a, quite a while ago then, right? Yes, I believe so. Um, I would say about 10 years ago, um, he started reading into it. So um, it's been quite a while in the making. Well, what I love about Jacob Levy is uh, with re is that uh, the discovery that he had uh, neurosyphilis or, you know, uh, paralysis of the insane, That uh, mm -hmm. because that was a, a possible motive of why Jack Ripper was killing these women because of the revenge thing. Definitely. Um, and there's also the fact that his mother died at the end of May, just before the killings. Um, took place a couple of months before the killings, so could this have been the trigger that really set him off? Um, he, the neurosyphilis, obviously, like you say, he died in 1891 of that, so he was in the asylum for a couple of years after the killings. Uh, he went in the asylum in 1890. So... What kind of when you said uh, he had uh, mental illness or, or something like that? So what was he? Um, was he a violent person? Like did he did he have issues like that? In 1886, he stole from his neighbour Hyman Samson, um, piece of meat. No one knows what his thinking was. It wasn't even a good piece of meat. 
he had £32 of his own money in his pocket. He didn't need it. Uh, so the police were actually watching. Hyman Samson obviously knew it had happened before. So he was caught in the act by police officers. And subsequently he was sent to prison. Um, while in prison, he tried to commit suicide. So he was sent to an asylum. We have the asylum note from the warden uh, which says that he is restless, pacing at night, um, and violence. So from that we've got to infer that he was violent at the time in 1886, but it doesn't go into any more details. It's just like notes on the page. Right. Um, when he was placed in the asylum in 1890, in his notes he says that he feels he will do damage to somebody or they will do damage to him. So again, there's that note of violence um, there. So there's kind of hints at that. Do, do you know if he had a wife or a girlfriend or um, people he hung out with a lot before he went to prison? He had his wife, Sarah. They married in 1879 and they had nine children in total. Wow. Uh, nine, wow. Nine, yeah. <laughs> He's like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I only have six. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. Yeah. I was oh, say oh. It. No, Doc That's says I'm all, I'm all set. Keep those diapers on, he says. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he keep... said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's in diapers. Uh, no, it's just interesting. Do, do you have any indication of how he treated his wife? Was there stories that he beat her or they had a bad relationship or beat his kids or anything like that? Was there any sort of abuse going on? We don't have a lot of information on this. Um, we know that when he was placed in the asylum, in Stone Asylum in 1890, his wife Sarah deposed that he had almost ruined hair business. So the butchery business had moved over to hair. We've got to assume that happened sometime in the prior five years, maybe when he got out of the asylum the first time round. Um, he'd started drinking heavily. He was no longer the good father that he used to be. I'm ad living that. I can't remember it word for word. Yeah, uh, yeah, well. So you could see a decline in the way he had been treating the family. So, um, hmm. I, I, it, it makes you curious of what the breakdown was, like why he, what triggered him. Yeah, um, I mean, if you look at neurosyphilis, there's a five year timeline that he hits exactly. Um, he started thieving in 1886 and he died in 1891 so that is the timeline of neurosyphilis to a T. We do know as we say that he got arrested. Now the next part is hypothesis on our part from the book. We know very shortly within nine days I believe off the top of my head he was arrested. His father Joseph died from intestinal problems. Um, so how that affected him. We don't know. He was obviously already mentally starting to unravel. I um, believe it was the day after he was arrested that his father took ill and died the week later. So obviously that may have been preying on his mind. Um, we know that he found his brother who committed suicide in 1875. He hanged himself in the bedroom we shared with Jacob. So it was Jacob who went up and found him hanging there. Um, so again, hypothesis on our part, but if you look at the victims, you have the fact that Jacob stated in the asylum records in 1890, his brother died from cutting his own throat, which is incorrect. He died from hanging. So is this an obsession with cutthroats there? And all the victims had cutthroats. Then you have his father dying from intestinal problems. And obviously a lot of the victims had been mutilated, should we say. 
So, was, I was just uh, saying there was also a connection, uh, proximity-wise, with this apron that they found. Could maybe you uh, talk about that? Yes, yeah. Um, basically, what happened is there was Catherine, Pat, Catherine Edwards' apron found um, that had held the kidney. And this was found in Wentworth Street uh, in a little alleyway. And so it was known as the Golson Street Graffiti. Um, and we found, we were able to link a possible link to Jacob in that if you go straight through this alleyway out the back, there was other blocks of buildings um, and in there lived his mother just before she died. Now, she died in the May, but his sister could have still lived there. If not, take heart, there's still hope. His brother actually lived in the building next door. So that would give him plausible reasons to be going through there and just getting rid of the apron as he went. Um, this was literally a two-minute walk from his home also. So where the Goulson Street is, Goulson Street buildings are, and Middlesex Street are literally next to each other. So he could have, we can posit, gone home, hid the kidney there, his butcher's shop after all, it would blend right in. Uh, walk two minutes, drop the apron, and he's safely at his mother's house or his brother's house. So it's a possible link to why the apron was found there. And also his, his home plus his relative's home are we're mm-hmm. near that area. Yeah. Right. And did he like to eat liver and onions? I'm not sure. I would imagine being a butcher. He wouldn't be a <laughs> Oh, I know. I'm terrible. I'm, I'm always getting myself into trouble. You know, um, it's interesting. So do you, did, was he a wealthy man? Did he live fairly well or was he really poor? Because you're saying that she had a business and he had a business. And, and even when he stole the neighbor's um, he had thirty-two pound in his pocket, and that's a lot of money back then. So, it was. I think he, they were comfortable um, at the time. Uh, obviously, I know yeah. when they lost, they lost the business. Um, obviously, he went into the asylum. Sarah either sold or had to give up the butchery business, uh, and she became a street hawker. So. My general inclination is that they don't do well. Um, they live hand-to-mouth type thing. So I think they may have lived comfortably while he was butchering. You know, I think it was a well-established buttery business. It went back generations, um, all the way down to his great-grandfather that we can find. So... And what's your thoughts on the letters? You know, the letters that were supposed to have come from uh, Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Um, do you believe in them? Do you, do you no. have any sort of idea that they belong? No, I, I don't. Even if, you know, you don't look at Jacob Levy, I just don't think, if you look at the crimes, I don't think he's the personality of somebody who would then sit and pen a letter. Um, nothing against people who do, I just, it's not my take on the type of person who will commit these crimes. Um, however, it does sound very likely. You know, I do tend to believe the ones from the Central News Agency um, to build the case, to build excitement and fear to sell newspapers. Uh, that is the type of letter that they are, isn't it? It instills excitement, it instills fear. So I tend not to really believe that they're part of the case. But the Goulston Street graffiti, I, I like how your twist on when it, if it was written <laughs> cursive, how that could very well have said Levy. <laughs> yeah. it, it just was too easy not to uh, go there, to be fair. But, yeah, right. uh, if you, if, we can't say it was. Um, we can't say it wasn't. Unfortunately, it, the decision was made to wash it off beforehand. But 
Jacob could have done it. He could have been carrying butcher's chalk, like say, could be the Levies and the men not to be blamed instead of the Jews. It was written on Hyman, where Hyman Samson. Um, now this is a very tenuous link, I admit, but it's still one of them coincidences. Hyman Samson, who lived next door to him in Middlesex Street, the butcher who Jacob pinched from and got sent okay. to prison, which started the full decline. Where the graffiti was placed is where his old shop used to be, exactly. Um, so Hyman Samson moved when the buildings got knocked down to make way for Wentworth Buildings. Uh, he moved next door to Jacob. So, But where the graffiti is in Wentworth Street is where he would have been. And so again, that's one huge coincidence. Uh, but I can also... I'm on the fence with the graffiti. I can understand why people... There's not enough evidence for me right. to well, say that it was definitely... Yeah. yeah. Well, there was, there was a lot of anti-Jew sentiment there, too, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you ever think um, about the violence that was you know, that was committed on each one of the victims. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular reason, do you think, that if Jacob Levy was the man, why do you think he was so violent in that? Why Why was he, you know, you know, doing yeah. that? I think there was a lot of anger there, wasn't there? There was a lot of hatred. Um, I don't know enough to say whether it was towards women, but, you know, people in the profession say it was. Um, we don't know how, what he grew up facing. We know that he would have been around dead animals. Um, chances are, he would have seen them get slaughtered from a young age. Uh, with being in the butchery, family trade, um, he would have been practicing. We know at the age of fifteen, in the census, he was already a, an apprentice butcher, so he would have been butchering for a few years before that. Uh, we know that his brother committed suicide when he was only 17. Uh, so there's factors there that could have caused somebody to turn into an angry, hateful person. Um, so with a butcher that uh, they would have at least a little bit of anatomical knowledge, and that's what they were talking about. And also they would not have any inclination of at least butchering animals it's just yes. uh, so but now here we have a mixture of this going on and maybe a little bit of neurosyphilis could be a cocktail of uh, danger yeah basically um you've got the like you say the right environment you've got the warren dens you've got the dark night you've got somebody who has skill with a knife who has the anger and the hatred there um so it could have just been a lot of factors all managed into one. Have you given any thought as to how he selected his victims? Um, would it be just random, or do you think he had a particular type of person he wanted to kill? Um, I suppose at first, because you, know, you could understand if it was the hatred of the mother, um, he did go for the older clientele, besides for Mary Kelly, but at that stage, maybe it was more about the kill and the victim by then. Um, but it could also be argued that, obviously, they were just easier prey because they needed the money, so they were willing to actually just go with any person who was willing to give them money. Um I don't think we just don't know enough of the motives behind, do we? Uh, yeah. Well, with, with that in mind, though, uh, by extension, uh, when you're looking at Jacob Levy and looking at, and it wasn't just the canonical five, which we call, as in Mary Kelly was the last. There were there were post-Mary Kelly murders, Mackenzie. And, uh, who um, who are you suspecting? Are you suspecting they were part of uh, the Jack the Ripper victims as well, or, or where would you stop, or do you not know? Or um, For me, Mary Kelly was the last um, murder victim, simply because I don't believe you could have that much 
rage and devolve to do that to another human being and then just carry on with normal life and the next time you kill it's not that intense to me you couldn't go back to a cutthroat and a little mutilation right. um, well, and it seems that would kind of explain uh, why possibly why he would have stopped he went to the extreme at that moment is that kind of how you're taking that um, I think yes and obviously neurosyphilis was up starting to really he was halfway through back then um so we, again we can't say for certain but reading up you would have been going through lucid stages and through stages where you're not as lucid these would have been getting worse um but yeah also the fact you know we don't know what was happening was he just so horrified this was the first time that had been indoors that could really take the time maybe he scared himself um perhaps getting cl almost getting caught might have been something yeah yeah we know the police were closing in was his cousin suspecting him um was it all getting too much you know with the neurosyphilis uh, so definitely don't think that there was any more killings after Mary Kelly. Um, we tend not to believe Liz Stride was a victim, but okay. we do Martha Tabram in as one. And again, it's literally just gone through the MOs of the victims. Martha Tabram seemed quite similar to the other victims without as much of the um, mutilations and that but again as we know now um, killers normally evolve and get more confident in the kills take more enjoyment as they go so that could explain Martha and adversely with Liz Stride we just believe that she was so different in the place that she was at the time that it was there the fact that there was a witness about um, just didn't seem like the fit, the crime, the fit, the person who was Jack the Ripper. Um, we tend to just feel that she was probably a more personal killer. Okay. The uh, Another question, the interesting thing you have that I, I would love to see future research on is uh, you're, you're possibly suggesting that uh, Swanson and Anderson's uh, suspect uh, may very well have been um, uh, Levy, uh, Joseph Levy. Is that right? The suspect was Joseph Levy. Yeah, the uh, the one at the uh, uh, seaside. Jacob Levy. Oh, the yeah. witness. Song. Yeah, I'm sorry. The witness. What did I say? Oh, suspect. The sorry. witness. Uh, yeah, my my fault. So the witness that uh, Swanson and uh, Anderson were kind of talking about. Could very well, uh, may very well have been uh, Joseph Levy. We think it could have been. Um, of course, as the how would he have to witness his cousin when he already would know his cousin? But obviously, there's going to be legal routes that you've got to go down. Um, it could also have been Schwartz. Um, it could have been. Joseph Lawand. I I always found it a little strange that Joseph Lawand and Joseph Hyam Levy give such different accounts to the who they saw. You know, given right. that there was only two people there, it seemed a bit odd that Joseph Hyam Levy didn't really see anyone. But besides the fact that there were around five foot two or three. Yeah, Joseph Lawand saw someone who was about five foot seven. Sailor's pig cap. You know, he described his attire. Harry Harry was all, Harry Harrison was also with them, seeing so nothing at all. You know, it's it's a little weird that all three seeing different things. So I think depending on who the police believed, they they called Joseph Luand as a witness. But they did seem quite irritated that Joseph Hyam Levy was withholding information there, felt, didn't they? So 
it's kind of a bit of an unknown. I think the fact that the name Kosminski was mentioned and it was quite a rare name at the time, yet you can link Joseph Hyam Levy with Martin Kosminski. Not trying to say at all that Martin Kosminski was involved, he wasn't. But it's just that name. How do you get that name? You know, it's another link, possible link. Oh, right. And, and maybe so he why did So why did Swanson write Kosminski? And there's there's a possible link between Levy and Kosminski. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of, is it literally just a case of, I don't want the name Levy out there. It's my name as well as Jacob Levy. It's my family who basically has to go through it all, pull them under a different name. Um, right. Pick a name that's never going to really be known or seen because all this is private and will never be shown to the public kind of thing. Uh, so you pick a name that is never going to be misinterpreted as somebody else's. So you pick a rare name, which would be Kosminski, which would have worked if you didn't have generation upon generations afterwards of Rickroll just wanting to know the truth. Right. Well, that's the fun part of research, and that's kind of <laughs> how you connected everything. The uh, other question I had is, uh, when uh, after the Ripper murders, when was he finally uh, uh, put into a sane asylum, and then when did he die? Yeah, he was put in the same... Oh, start that one again. He was put in the insane <laughs> asylum um, in August of 1890, uh, and he died, I think it was about 11 months later, in 1891. Okay. Do you think anybody else was ever involved? Do you think, because there's some, some people that believe there's more than one person involved, for instance. Yeah. Do you, think that, do you think that he had help, or do you think someone else knew and aided him, or just didn't tell? Uh, I think at the very most, somebody may have suspected I'm not told, but I don't think that they kept a secret that they actually knew it was him, and I don't think that they would have helped. Um, Just curious, I, yeah, I, you know, cause, you know what, what about his wife, you know, would you think she would understand or kind of realize he was out butchering people? No, I think if anything, she probably maybe believed that he was obviously he he didn't sleep at night he was would go out walking a lot he was restless muttering talking to himself um he went out on walks she maybe just felt that he was just literally going out on walks just going to fight the demons so to speak so i don't think that she would have maybe suspected him and blood on his hands would be nothing because he's a butcher Basically, yeah, yeah. You've got the perfect, perfect place to hide body parts. Back then, you wouldn't have been able to identify the difference. As you say, you can walk around with bloody claws, bloody hands. Um, you're constantly surrounded by other butchers' shops and slaughterhouses. So people would be used to seeing him with yeah. that kind of attire on. But was it? Didn't Jack the Ripper uh, take some of the ears ears off of the victims to send them? Or um, he clipped one of the ears. Um, that was in one of the newsletters, I believe, and they believed it was sent before the murder, but it was actually sent after. But it was actually found in a clause when uh, she went to the postmortem. Right. March. Right. Um, it was actually found there. So it was mainly the kidneys and that um, that were taken. Um, Mary Kelly's heart was never found. So, What do you think he did with the, the parts that he took, that he didn't lose or send in? Like, what do you think he actually did with them? Yeah, it's a puzzle, isn't it? Um, I don't want to say the obvious answer and say eat them, but why else would oh. you take them? Um Obviously, for hundreds of thousands of years, a long, long time, people believed that by eating body parts of other people, you gain strength and 
brain power and things like that. I suppose it would depend on the delusion. Um, huh. Well, maybe he cooked them up and served them. Maybe. Maybe he sold them on. <laughs> this is just funny. With, <laughs> with a bottle of Chianti, are you saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, you know, it's just it's just curious because yeah. you know, you know, and didn't 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 he take a uterus or something too, or had one? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. There's not a lot you could do with them. You know, they're, they're just going to decay. You couldn't keep them like you could jewelry or something like that. So <laughs> oh, it's just weird. Um, his mother. Did you know? Did you ever find out what she did for an occupation? Like, what was what was his mother? Do you know? Um, she was a butcher, as well as Joseph Levy, and his okay. father. Yeah. So she was the one who died. Um, right. Right. I was just wondering if, if, if maybe she was, you know, uh, maybe she was promiscuous or she did things and it, he yeah. didn't like it, and you know, kind of if you knew anything like that. No, um, we can't really. The worst we could find really was the fact that she had. Joseph's baby of wedlock. Um, she obviously she had two children prior. Um, Joshua Solomon's. She had Rebecca and Jane. Um, he died, and she gave birth to I believe it was Hannah off the top of my head. Um, about I think it was about twelve months later, and. Then she had another daughter before they married, and that's the worst we could really find. Well, that was pretty pretty bad back then. I think it, yeah, I think it would depend on who and where you were based. I um, guess, yeah. So, you know, the Levy family, while I wouldn't say were prominent prominent people, they were obviously well known within the community. Um, so. There's not like some big red flag. We don't know a lot about her. We can. She really has been one of the hardest ones to trace. We can't find no birth certificate, no mother or father. Well, sorry, we know her father was called Abraham through the wedding certificate, marriage certificate. But you know, looking for Abraham Solomon's really is just like looking for a Jane Doe and Michael Smith. Um, so. There could be some things in her past, but yeah, as of yet, I haven't been managed. I haven't managed to be able to find them yet. So you're still researching, though. Yes, uh, that one. That's my grey elephant. Is Caroline Solomon's. Um, she's one who I just I have spent hundreds of hours trying to trace, um, and there's just nothing at the minute. We actually yeah. went to West Ham. To, uh, View a grave, a headstone. Um, unfortunately, it's collapsed face down, so I'm not allowed to pick it up. Um, oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, because they're going to try and preserve them, so they'll do it properly with proper tools and hopefully be able to get something off um, the stone. But he said, unfortunately, when it's like this, normally you find the Clamp from the ground, just eats away at the right. the stone, right. so not to expect too much. That was about Mike, years ago, and I've never heard any. Mike over there, he'll do it. He'll do it. <laughs> there you right. go. <laughs> the what are they going to do, deport him? Come on. <laughs> so, so where are you going to go next? Are you going to continue this research and kind of uh, do more um, with Jacob and, and his family, or where do you see yourself? Yeah, I mean, I would like to find more information on Jacob. Um, the that's you know the Jewish community. The amount of information they keep is unbelievable. There's always more information there every time you you look. Um, so I would like, like you say, I would like to find more on Caroline Solomon's Rebecca and Jane. Rebecca, we found um, she's the one. She married Nathan Hyams, um, but Jane Solomon's couldn't find her after uh, the second census. Obviously, she probably may be married, and so 
and um, struggled to find her. Joshua, Joshua Solomon's Caroline's first husband, wouldn't mind trying to find more on him. Um, we only have his burial information and his death certificate. So it would be good to see his side of the family as well. So there is some stuff that I would like to do more for me rather than to put yeah. into a book or something. You might want to check with the Mormons, right? They're really good at that. Yeah, yeah. The Ancestry.com and CA and UK and all that. They do all of that. They're huge on records and names and all of that. They're huge on that. Yeah. I use them a lot. Yeah. Yeah, just be careful. They don't know where you live. But, but <laughs> it, it, it'd be really, really a good resource uh, to go to. They They tend to be... Uh, amazing record collector so you know something to think about uh, definitely now oh, at yeah. the end it's, so when someone reads your book do you have a an, an idea or something you want them to walk away with is there something that um you want them to know um i think it's a good question um mainly just to see that there's a lot of suspects out there that do deserve to take your time out and read and just because you don't necessarily believe that it's that suspect it doesn't mean that they're wrong and uh, you know as we say in the book nobody can ever prove their suspect nowadays too much time's gone by and um, there's too much disbelief now that things have been posited with dna and things that have been proven wrong um even if the general article came up now, nobody would believe it. So nobody can prove it. So just read and make up your own mind and um, what you believe. Right. Well, it was it was my great grandfather, and he was also Zodiac and <laughs> and who else? Who else? Uh, he was a mm -hmm. lot of people. So, yeah. Uh, actually, do you have a website or anything that you have for people to go find you, or where do you like people to look you up? Oh, um, I've been asked that before, just Facebook. <laughs> I haven't really. Oh, okay. um, well, no. I know Mango Books, uh, the publisher has Mango Books. So okay. Adam all Wood. Sales. Yes, Adam. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wood. Well, well, we'll actually put that on the website so people could have some place to go find your book and maybe find a little bit about it, and uh, that's great. Well, it's been a pleasure. We've enjoyed talking. Uh, uh, the book is called uh, Jacob the Ripper, and our guest has been Tracy Ionson. Well, it, it was great speaking with you, Tracy. Great speaking with you too. I uh, enjoyed it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.